Good afternoon from Vienna to everyone and welcome to this IA Fusion Energy Conference site event featuring the role of UN in fusion. My name is Sheila Gonzalez, I'm nuclear fusion physicist at the International Atomic Energy Agency and it's my pleasure to be today moderating this event. Women account for less than 30% of the world's scientists and researchers and this percentage is even lower in fields such as nuclear physicists and nuclear engineering including fusion science and technology. Today, four renowned female fusion experts will discuss the, what the role of women in fusion science and technology is and how to increase female representation in this field. It's my honor and my pleasure to introduce our panelists today. First one, Mrs. Uh, Gabriela Saiben, head of the unit uh, plasma engineering and operation at Fusion for Energy. Please, Gabriela. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Mrs. Liao Ming, section leader in Magnets at ITER organization. Please. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Nice to meet you. Mrs. Simona Breido Kaite from uh, Lithuanian Energy Institute and a PhD student in Fusion. Please, Simona. Good afternoon, everyone. And Mrs. Sabrina Joal, strategic development executive at General Atomic. <coughs> Please, Good Sabrina. afternoon. Good afternoon. It's nice to be here. Before we start it, I would like to ask all the attendees to send their questions in the chat box and indicate for which speaker the question is. We will answer you your question after the panel discussion and also please note that the event, the event is being recorded. I would like to give floor now to Mrs. Nayan Mokat, IA Deputy Director General and Head of the Department of Nuclear Science and Application to open this event. Unfortunately, Mrs. Motark couldn't not join us live today, but we will play her pre-recording opening remarks. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, it's my pleasure to open this Fusion Energy Conference side event, discussing the role of women in fusion science and technology. There is a good reason why fusion has been an area of great interest for decades. Fusion power holds the promise of potentially limitless carbon-free energy supply. Fusion atoms together in a controlled way can release nearly 4 million times more energy than burning of coal, oil or gas, but does not emit harmful pollutants into the atmosphere. Imagine what it would mean for the world to have a source of abundant energy with no greenhouse gas emission. We all know the famous joke about fusion that is in 30 years away and always will be. But recent technical advancement and scientific breakthrough in the field prove that we are closer and even, uh, than ever to achieving commercially viable fusion energy on Earth. Today, we will discuss the role of women in fusion science and technology development, how to support female experts to excel in their career and how to increase the female representation in this still very male-dominated field. Many organizations around the world are working hard to promote gender parity and the IA specifically is working to promote gender equity in nuclear sciences application and technologies. In fact, our IA Director General has committed the agency to target gender parity in its professional staff, meaning attaining 50% women and 50% men by year 2025. Therefore, the IA has started a number of initiatives to reach that target. For example, the agency has adopted a set of special measures for the achieve, achievement of gender parity, including appointing more women in senior positions. The IA also organizes global online career fairs for women and monthly webinars focusing on women at the agency and the recruitment process. The Marie Curie uh, Sklod Sklodowska Curie Fellowship Program was launched by the agency last year. This program will support up to 100 female graduate students per year to help increase the pipeline of women working in nuclear science and technology. 
With this, I would like to open this event and give the floor to our panelists. I wish to thank them all for taking the time to share their stories and their insight and thank you all for joining us today. I'm excited to hear the presentations, discussion, and questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nayad, for your opening remarks. For those who you would like to learn more about the career opportunities for women at the International Atomic Energy Agencies, I would advise to visit our website. All the information can be found there. And now we will need to start with our panel discussion. So my first question is to Gabriela. Gabriela, you have more than 30 years of experience in the field of fusion. Can you please, please tell us what have changed over the last 30 years in terms of female representation of you in fusion? Do you see any development in terms of inclusion of women in the workplace? Thank you for the question, Sheila. Yes, uh, uh, of course, there is been progress in, uh, in the inclusion of women in nuclear science. And this can be seen even in, during this conference by the, name of, uh, by the number of female speakers that, uh, that we, had comp we had compared to previous, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago, okay? However, I think that the progress has been too slow and uh, at uh, this pace uh, we will never get uh, to gender parity and uh, I share very much uh, the content and the, the, the ideas that your uh, Deputy Director General has just put forward in her uh, uh, video ago. For me, uh, simply uh, uh, aiming at equal opportunity has not worked. And I think uh, that uh, now is the time uh, to have uh, some positive action to really bring forward the talent uh, that is in all the women scientists uh, and technologists around us. And uh, uh, my personal experience, uh, as you were saying over 30 years, is a long time, uh, is uh, that uh, there is a glossary that uh, is used uh, in uh, science and technology that uh, becomes more and more important the more you prog progress in your career. Uh, our the pyramid for women is very steep and it's very hard to, to climb. And when you get there, you start to learn that if a colleague, a male colleague is assertive and a leader, uh, you are bossy. If uh, somebody is passionate and committed, you are emotional. And uh, if uh, you are self-assured and confident, you are pushy. And uh, this, to me, is a, a culture environment that we need to change. And uh, uh, so uh, what, what can I say? I think that uh, as a uh, you know, senior person in, in the fusion community, what I would like to, to, to be is uh, an example saying that you can make it, and that, uh, uh, I mean, change uh, needs to, will come, but it needs to come uh, through uh, active um, and a proactivity. It doesn't come on its own with uh, simply a, a, a notice on, uh, on a vacancy notice saying uh, you are, uh, we are an equal opportunity uh, institution. That, uh, that is good, but it's not sufficient. And, uh, well, to me, uh, science and technology for fusion are a field of excellence. And excellence has to, to be achieved, has to draw on all the talent that, it, that, that you can find. And uh, it is a pity and a, and a waste that a, a lot of female talented scientists uh, are... Uh, when they come out of university, they don't even try to get into, in, into this area. Or when they are at university, they don't uh, go so, towards uh, nuclear science and technology. And it's a message that all of us that we are already here have to try to combat it to, with example and, and uh, try to convince uh, women that they can, they can make it, that they will find uh, mentors and friends that will help them. 
in, in the various institutions, laboratories, etc. And uh, with that, I think I've said what I had to say. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gabriela. I take two key words. Talent is or oh, two key expressions. Talent is everywhere and you need mentors and guidance and friends to succeed. I think these are two powerful messages of your of your uh, statements. Absolutely. So now we move to the junior person in the panel list, who is Simona. Simona, you are currently doing your PhD and just started your career in fusion. Can you please tell us that if you have experience in any of these gender-based uh, challenge mentioned by Gabriela? Uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, I don't think that I can refer you to Gabriela. As you mentioned, I'm uh, just starting my career and my colleagues, men colleagues, now the main task is to transmit my, their experience and knowledge to me. And I think I'm at the learning stage and and that's because I, and that is because I cannot refer you to Gabriella at, at this moment. But no one knows what would, will be on, on the future. Thank you very much, uh, Simona. We now move to the next uh, question for Sabrina, who has a really, really interesting background. Sabrina, you started your career in the Navy, an overwhelming male-dominated field. You serve at the first female as the first female officer on the guided missile destroyed and led difficult female uh, integration efforts. Now you are pursuing a doctorate in leadership studies with an emphasis on gender studies in high technical, commercial, and military fields. From your experience, what are the three most important milestones we have to achieve to reach gender equity in male-dominated fields, such as the nuclear industry is? Thank you, Sahila. Um, so your question uh, relies on the three most important milestones. If I were to think about the most important, I would say number one being successfully implementing policy. Two, more education and training is needed. And three, a vibrant network to improve communication among women. So the first one, policy in some ways is the most straightforward because it can be driven from the top down. Uh, the deputy director general mentioned metrics and goals for achieving 50-50 parity among males and females, which is a great goal and it will definitely help. As more women jump into the field, there'll be more role mod models to follow. But accepting policy and providing compliance needs buy-in throughout all of the ranks to be effective. Individuals in the field need to be aware of the need, the actual need for change. And that leads me to the second point. You cannot create a solution if there isn't an acknowledgement of the problem or the challenge. And there may be individuals in our community that truly do not think there is a problem. Yet I truly believe there are real inherent gender biases that often go unacknowledged and generate real impact on our field of fusion and other highly technical fields of society. Education and training can assist in making people aware of these inherent biases and acknowledging them is a very important first step. We as scientists and engineers like and love data. In some cases, we live by data. We need to study and interpret our existing engagements to provide those metrics and data to individuals to convince them. I think that's the first step in convincing the community that there is in fact an issue or a challenge. Data collection is already occurring in some cases and in, of late, it's becoming more of a focus, which I think is great, but we can still do more. The true cost and impact of these biases on our organization need to be better understood. More training, workshops, and studies are valuable in beginning to plan for the resolution. And that leads me to the third important milestone of developing a vibrant network for females to collaborate and communicate. Community is paramount to women and networking and mentoring among women to support and provide opportunities is extremely important. As someone who was involved in the very early integration efforts in the United States Navy, as you mentioned, 
I did experience firsthand how difficult it can be to not have a large active network for guidance and inspiration. And sometimes the best motivation to overcome difficulty is to put individuals in touch with people like them who have already taken that first step. We need to provide more mentorship for women and even little girls. They need to see others like them in the field before large numbers of individuals will be inspired to move in that direction. Hostile environments continue to drive highly qualified women out of the field and support from mentors and a network can in certain cases prevent this. So in summary, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to discuss these issues. And I think that this panel is a really great first step in moving in the right direction. Thank you very much, uh, Sabrina. I take from your statement two key words. One thing is mentoring that we already hear in Gabriela and also networking. I think okay. you focus on these two words. Thank you. So we now move uh, to us and uh, Ming, who is working at ITER. So from your position, how do you see the role of international organizations such as uh, the International Atomic Energy uh, ITER in promoting and supporting gender equity? Um, thank you, Sahila. For your first question for the role of the senior female uh, manager. So women who have made it to leadership roles are making a significant uh, contribution. In workspace, the nuclear industry show have programs to attract and recruit women. The purpose of the program is to bring the education, leadership, and, uh, and support to attract more women to nuclear. And otherwise, they would be missing out on the competitive advantage their talents could bring. I knew China has a state mechanism to prolong uh, gender equity and development of women. It was launched from Beijing side as a white paper in Geneva, Switzerland International Conference in 2015. As a Zabrin Sabrina pointed out in her strategy study, I noticed multiple mechanisms get involved in the participation, preparation, and uh, implementation. Um, so the promotion, support, and monitoring of the gender mainstreaming have merged as the most significant role of the national mechanism. Me, myself, uh, exactly was benefit from uh, the program. I come from a Southwestern Institute of Physics and SWEEP, which is the oldest and largest tokamak institute in China. As a long profit organization with thousands of employees, SWEEP advocates for stronger roles for women in nuclear science and technology, increasing awareness of the importance of gender balance in men dominated fields. So this pro program provides me a variable opportunity as the young, youngest female division head of technical center in SWEEP. It brings more female voices in senior technical position to discuss about uh, the future of nuclear technology and Chinese fusion um, strategy. Um, female staff can contribute to HR2A Tokmark and updated Tokmark design and development uh, of a physics database as well. And <laughs> although they are mainly talented and high, highly skilled women within the nuclear industry, we are still largely underrepresented, as Sahila said at the beginning. So women are less than 30 percentage of the workforce in nuclear fusion field. This is still a lot of work to do. So how to develop a women workforce pipeline and fix the le leaks? Many organizations, including IEA, are actively working to increase the share of the women in all job categories. So I think ITER, in ITER, so women seem to prefer certain occupations like safety, quality, contracts, finance, HR. I don't think it's just a matter of applied engineering, bring men dominated its preference uh, for emotion related job skills and for your second uh, part uh, you and you asked what's my personal support for my staff uh, in ITER 
I fully support initiatives and that encourage girls to enter the fusion and help them to be fully involved in specific um, expertise field they can contribute and show them uh, the routings to senior positions. So I'm creating a supportive environment such as a flexible working arrangement that enables the staff members to combine work and family responsibilities. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ming. I was taking notes of uh, keywords from you, and you mentioned supporting environment, and I, you also highlighted at the beginning of your contribution to, to the discussion the, high, uh, the benefits of uh, a group of women in fusion coordinated by international organizations. I think these two things are very good message from your statement. So we ask again to Sabrina. Sabrina, you also mentioned uh, network opportunities. In your view, which uh, what, what factors are important to consider when establishing when establishing such groups? Um, so, if we want to drive real change, we need sustainability and continuity. In order to achieve this, I think commitment and dedication from both leadership and organizations is paramount. Dedication cannot just come from a few passionate individuals in the field. We need our organizations and leadership to devote the necessary resources in developing a strategic roadmap with metrics and milestones to drive success. In addition to the leadership and organization perspective, we need dedication from our community at large which includes females as well as males. I recall the introduction of my first ship in the Navy. Um, before I went on board the ship, the crew went through sensitivity training on how to treat a female officer. I was not part of the training and thus I was not part of the solution. I truly believe that the result was not as successful as it could have been because I wasn't collaborating and having a voice in some of the potential major issues. Similarly, in this situation, we need to be gender inclusive in our solution. We also need representation from all demographics, from new entrants in the field to mid-career individuals and those who are at the tail end of their career to pass on their wisdom. So in summary, I think to truly make a broad difference and sustain change, we'll need commitment from our leadership and individuals, the devotion of resources, and an inclusive movement with representation of all members of our community. Thank you Mary, very much, Sabrina. I like a lot what you say about uh, creating or setting up a strategic roadmap. And for that, you need sustainability and continuity. Otherwise, it's not serious. Let's put it in that way. So, Simona. As a junior professional, as uh, I mentioned before, what kind of support do you and your colleagues uh, need to advance in your career? What What are your feelings? What would you need to progress? I, I think that that thing was mentioned a lot of times in, in this, in this uh, area. It's men mentoring system, some kind, but we, it, uh, we have to know that sometimes if we have an obstacle, we can go to someone and ask how they defeat it, how they step on it. And I think the mentoring system, something all the, that can give you knowledge of what is better to do in some situations that male colleagues cannot tell you about that. So the main thing for sure is mentoring system. As for example, a couple of years ago, I was in a Women in Nuclear Conference, and there was a session of mentoring where young scientist women can exchange contacts with the elder, elder professionals and contact them if they need help or if they want to just chat about what the kind of obstacles there is in the future, maybe. So I think, yeah, there is okay. anything. So I understand you will need mentoring first and networking to be able to get this mentoring as a key element yes. for young people. Thank you very much. So we move to the last question of this part of, of the event, which is again to Gabriela. Gabriela, what would you like to see as a change in terms of gender parity in fusion science and technology before the end of your career? And what the legacy do you want to leave? 
to younger generations. Well, uh, what I would like to see is all that uh, has been discussed uh, in, uh, previously, but in particular, I'm really convinced that uh, that uh, mentoring any, uh, and, and networking are, are really important. It is important also to uh, a point that Sabrina made, that to me is fundamental, is acknowledgement of the problem. Because uh, not only men don't acknowledge this problem, many women don't. And, uh, and uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, only by uh, really bringing the issues on the table and not uh, being deterred by being uh, classified as uh, proto-feminists is uh, the only way that, uh, that, uh, that exists to, to open an honest conversation and, and to, to therefore acknowledge what needs to be fixed. Otherwise, you cannot fix it. And uh, what I would like personally uh, one thing that I have uh, suffered a bit in, uh, in, in my career, uh, uh, more when I went more into management and then when I was doing a pure scientific work, I have to say, is uh, uh, a little bit the macho uh, attitude of uh, the, the macho style of management that is not necessarily practiced only by men, by the way. And uh, to me, this uh, is uh, something that is a deterrent for, uh, for uh, many women and for some men to try to get uh, to, to into, in, into the career uh, race, if you want, to try to climb the, the pyramid. And uh, to me, it's a very detrimental in, in, in top engineering and science. It, 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 it doesn't square with the, with the values of it. So my, what I would like to see, I, I would like from, from now on to really dedicate a fixed part of my professional time to try to uh, do these uh, mentoring actions, try to participate into networks so that uh, I can uh, bring my little bit of word into this uh, a bit larger uh, uh, situations and so that my experience can, if if it's valuable, can be used. So I would like to, 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 to do that and in my management uh, uh, function, try to be an example of a leadership that is, uh, say, if you want, women compatible. <laughs> that brings in uh, uh, women that, that uh, helps them to grow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriela. Um, I see that uh, when you go high, uh, things become more difficult. Let's put it in that way. Yes. yes. It's an important message for, 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 for us to understand, and in particular for young people like Simona, so they can yeah. be prepared. So now we are going to move to the Q&A session coming from the audience. We have already a number of questions, and I will try to do my best to put it uh, to the panelists. So I have some notes here, and the first one is to me, can me could you explain what is um, ITER organization uh, having in support of fusion women? Well, um, you see, as uh, Gabriella already sharing as uh, her great uh, experience, and from her point of view, uh, there are a lot of the change and development have been made in the last thirty years. So, from my view, um, in fact, uh, with longer timeline. I see the role of ETER and IEA um, to support the women female is education, leadership, and support. They are the key to attracting more women to nuclear. And you know, professional network groups for women remains valuable. So, you know, when a woman asks questions and share and the problems she's facing and others women throughout idea for solving her challenges, this experience is very accelerating. So, and it leaves participants feeling powerful. That's why we say this network and the functions of this international organization is great. Um, this is an example from IEA. If, uh, if we remember what happened over the last 60 years, whatever towards closing the gender gap in nuclear science or improving the gender balance in nuclear energy, 
IAEA really got very impressive progress and contribution on that. So largely, largely, and at the um, beginning, in 1957, only 40 female staff for support functions and secretary roles. Now it's uh, growing up to 300 out of 1,000 female staffing being in the professional or higher categories. That is very impressive. And in future, women's talents will be truly recognized in the nuclear community. That's an example from IAEA. And I also I would uh, share with you the example from ITER. You know, we have the Molaco ITER postdoctoral fellowship scheme assigned, signed in 2008. So we always have one female out of five young scientists or engineers from the countries selected every two years. And it will attract PhD tell, um, female students like our <laughs> Simola, Simola, the junior professional infusion to contribute to the project through their original specialist research. And, and also ITER have established a women's network in 2018 within 341 fellowships. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Min, for this uh, information. So we move to the next question. I have notes here. It's coming. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for contributing to this conference and make it accessible to the public. So thank you. My question to all panelists, what would be your advice to next generations who wants to become part of Fusion? To whoever who wants to answer. Maybe Gabriela, you are the uh, more senior one. You can uh, give some hint to the person. Well, the fact that I'm more senior doesn't mean that I'm the wisest. But uh, okay, I, I don't know. My my advice would be study, 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 and try to be the best because uh, you will be judged a little bit more harshly than than uh, your male colleagues. So you have to do that little bit more to to get to the same place. And uh, I hope that this is not like that for longer. Probably this won't be needed in, in a little while, but for now, yes. And uh, second, uh, uh, stick to your friends, to your colleagues, uh, help each other uh, in uh, finding jobs, in, in, uh, in when you are in a job, in uh, sharing experiences, etc. because this will make uh, you uh, stronger and more effective in, in your role as a scientist. Or a, or a technical or, a, or an engineer in, in your confusion. Thank you very much, Gabriela. If someone wanted to add something else, if not, we can move to the next question. We have a number of them, so we better move. Uh, how is the geographical spread of female representation in the world? I, I understand female uh, representation in, in, in technical fields, I would say. Sabrina, do you have any information about that? Maybe you could uh, help us in understanding how is this, uh, because it's not completely the same situation in all countries and even regions, because some cultural uh, implications in this uh, distribution. So the question was, how is the geographical spread of female representation in the world? Um, and the the so, female uh, working in or studying technical careers, pursuing technical careers. So right now in Europe, PhD students, the female representation is around 20%. I think that's relatively consistent within the United States. Um, I think overall, you can kind of think of it as about one in every five being female in these technical fields. When you go into um, military ranks, at least within the United States, it gets a little bit even lower. Anyone, uh, Ming, maybe you can complement something from China, from your views, appreciation? Um, uh, yes, I can have a short supplement. I think uh, for the um, development, we appreciate the international organization to develop the pipeline, especially for young girls talent pipeline through regular outreach activities. For example, we organize a laboratory visit for primary and secondary school students to motivate the youth 
and we signed more fellowship program through a partnership arrangement to support young professional earlier in their careers. This is a wonderful initiative. I'm very pushy with that to start from the very beginning when you are at the school to promote uh, technical and scientific activities. Yeah. So thank you very much. So we move to the next question, which is for Simona. When did you hear for the first time about fusion in Lithuania? Uh, in Lithuania, we don't have some something fusion devices, but first time that I heard about fusion was in lectures, of course. One of my male colleagues was giving lectures about that, and it was around, for me, about fusion was around four years ago, I think, in, in, in my bachelor degree studies. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move to next uh, question. At the, at the moment, we have less than 20% of PhD students in Europe which, who are female, and the number is not necessarily increasing. Would you have any hints how to keep those females in fusion? My understanding is that cute, uh, cute, uh, quite a few women leave fusion after the PhD. I think this is a very good, interesting question. How to make them to stay, not to just leave the field and uh, move to other business? Um, who wants to, to answer? Sabrina, you want to? Say something and later on, maybe, uh, Gabriela? I think in this case, this is where it would be really good to get more data and do some exit studies and really follow up with some of these women who are leaving the field to find out exactly why. Because I haven't seen any really good um, study saying why this is so. And, um, you know, once you understand the the issue and the problem, then you can start developing a solution. But I think in this case, this is an area where we need a few more studies. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gabriela, do you want to complement on that? Well, I agree with what Sabrina just said. I really don't know, uh, honestly, why this is the case. And, uh, uh, and which is uh, the proportion of women that, uh, that do not push on infusion after uh, they, they are PhD compared to, to men. The field is competitive, probably there is no good opportunities for everybody. However, I think that this is something where the change uh, must come from the top. And, and the initiatives that, that your director, Deputy Director General was mentioning of having a, a positive action to attract, to retain women in scientific and technical fields, uh, I'm sure would help, would help to say, look, uh, here we guarantee to you 50% of the places in this lab or, or something like that. That would be, would encourage people, would encourage people, that would encourage women that maybe are not very optimistic when they go to conference, etc. and they, they just see uh, I see a man, essentially. <laughs> I mean, I've been the only woman in a room so my, many, many times, and and I'm still am in many things. So okay. it, it's a bit, it's a bit frightening. So positive uh, discrimination, please. <laughs> I will, I will <laughs> say that uh, this is not only a problem in fusion. I think it's a general issue in all scientific and technical areas that after the PhD, women tend to, to leave or not to pursue a um, higher career, let's put it in that way. So I think this uh, approach to generate more opportunities could be a very good uh, starting point to solve the, to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So let's move to next uh, question because we have, as I said before, a, a, a few. It's a question to Sabrina, but I think open to all the panelists. Is the percentage of females in fusion and fission comparable? Amin can also uh, provide some information about that. So please. Uh, in fact, for the um, portions of nuclear and, uh, and fusion, which I mentioned is largely underrepresented. In, in nuclear and field, I think in the study report, we are less than 30 percentage from IEA study report. And for new and for fusion is even less. We are less than quarter 
We are less than a quarter of the female workforce in this field. And what uh, I would uh, propose uh, how to enforce and to encourage females to, um, to, to be um, in, developed in this field is kind of uh, to break the gender imbalance and pull out, pull out all our effort and work together. And, and kind of women are good for business, right? We all know. But women need to find the sponsors. So here we need to be sponsors. And it uh, largely rely on this uh, effort of the international organization. And I encourage, encourage people to open the vision to attend the international meetings, to know what is topic in this expertise field. I'm, I'm, I, I want to share my experience, for example. So after I got my PhD and uh, um, my program to attract more females to, to, to be developed in this field is I encourage them to attend a lot of this uh, international conference. For example, there is Asia Plasma Fusion Associated and um, linked to China, Japan and Korean. So, you know, and the outcome of this uh, collaboration and encourage them, the female staff to attend. So in the last 10 years, seven females published dozens of scientific papers and authorizing 11 patent, pa patents. And me, I also, I received the rewards as outstanding young scientist in 2011. So that's kind of the good positive outcome <laughs> for that. Thank you very much. Uh, Sabrina, do you want to add something? Now, the only thing that I, uh, comes to mind for me that I think is really interesting is that people may assume it has to do with having an analytical mind and perhaps women aren't as analytical as men. But the interesting thing is that women and men have parity in, in technical fields at a young age. They're just as competent, just as capable at a young age. And then it's when they get to around high school, 16 years old, that women and girls start becoming uninterested in the field. And so even, even as we have PhD students who aren't pursuing the field, we also have it happening at a younger age. And I would be very interested in understanding why that's so. You can make some guesses and again, this is where it comes down to data. And this is why I want to go back and, and sort of study some of these trends and understand why. Um, you know, one thing that comes to mind is historical representation of females in technical fields have not been highlighted as much in the way the history books read. And it's been a lot of focus on male achievements. Yet we know that there were females and they're doing a lot of really good work and so I think, you know, the more we can highlight that, this goes back to this idea of, of girls seeing others like them in the field and having that aha moment of, oh, I can do that too. And so um, I think that's an interesting phenomena. Thank you very much. I'm really having uh, overwhelmed with so many questions that I have to go to select a few ones because we are running out of time. I really thank all the people, uh, contributing to the chat. Um, I think we should be running this for one more hour to be able to answer all of them. All of them very, very nice uh, question and important. So I want to read one uh, comment that I have. Uh, networking is really important. EPS conference has uh, been organizing a meeting about women in plasma physics and collecting data on the participation of women in the conference since 2004. That could be a really interesting uh, source of information for us, so it's good to, uh, to know. I also have um, other question, uh, other comments. So it's, it's really, really nice. My congratulations for you uh, for your outstanding achievements so far. Thank you, thank, thank you for setting a mother for my daughter that can, lap, can look up to. So this is uh, really encouraging, honestly. Um, I would like to read also this uh, important question. From your experience, do you have any tips or techniques for dealing with, in, in, for instance, with uh, unconscious bias as they occur? 
Uh, for example, when a good person unthinkly treats you different than whether they would have a man in the same position. I think this is unconscious bias, bias is really an important issue because you are not aware about, but it happens. Could you, I mean, maybe Gabriela, you can complement on that, or you can answer on that. Yes, uh, I think uh, that uh, I agree, unconscious biases are, uh, are we all have them, and uh, there is a particular unconscious bias for gender uh, that, uh, that uh, creeps about uh, in our organizations. I think uh, that this has to be treated uh, professionally in the sense that uh, there aren't uh, very ma many kitchen recipes, and I think that our organization should have uh, uh, good and uh, say periodic conscious by unconscious bias trainings to which everybody has to go from uh, the top management to the, the last uh, of the PhD students uh, that came in uh, the day before yesterday because this is uh, uh, something that uh, is intrinsic in our human nature and has to be treated uh, by professionals that know what they are talking about and uh, they can teach us how to control it. It won't be eliminated, but how to control it. I'm going to be a little bit challenging. Simona, how do you feel about what uh, Gabriela comment? Would you be happy to attend one of these uh, courses, training, seminars? Do you think that would be important for you and your colleagues, male and female? Yes. And of course, as I mentioned, I want to make a note. Everyone talking about teaching and the gender-based, as mentioned, gender-based bias, as mentioned at this question, I was uh, in in university. Some professors treat boys better than girls. So I think we should not just treat us and try to learn from us. That course would be a great how to deal with it. But of course, the elder, elder male professors have to start treating us equally in, in, in lessons. I think if there is one one thing. There have to be the two two types of of courses. One for females to learn how to deal with it, and another for male how to not do it. I think <laughs> <laughs> this is a very interesting comment. Anyone wants to complement to that? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it might be interesting to discuss with you. From my point, one note here is not to reverse discriminate with uh, women in team because it will create a conflict with men. So I, so it's another bias so it's not, uh, because it's, uh, going from men's world to women's world isn't progress. It leads to be even handed. Um, my role is to give women opportunities and create a gender neutral team just to avoid another uh, gender equi equities in our team. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other yeah. comment re related to this uh, question? I, I may have a supplement to what Lamin just said. I, I, society likes to put people in a box and they put a box around women just like they put a box around men. And they have expectations for women and expectations for men. And that varies by culture. I think what we're seeing of late is some of those boxes, people are questioning them on both sides. And from my perspective, that's a good thing because everybody is an individual in their own right. And I think one of the issues we're addressing here today of, of having women in technical fields, that might just be one of these boxes that have been formed around the female gender for whatever reason, from um, probably historical reasons. And so now is a very good time to start questioning and start you know, going beyond that box. Thank you very much. I selected a comment and a question from uh, the Q&A that they, I think they are linking that they touch both the same situation, family. So uh, the comment is one of the uh, reasons women are more likely to live after obtaining a PhD is that they are discouraged by the uncertainty career path and is less, which is less compatible with starting a family because it's a usual age where women start a, a family. And the other is a question about um, 
IA uh, fellowship that they are um, ready after maternity leave. So in both questions, by the way, the question um, providing some information to uh, to the the person who asked about this uh, IA at, uh, activities. So I will encourage her to go to the IA webpage and check for the Marie Curie initiative. They are very interesting. Please go there and check it. But what I wanted to discuss with you, this is how maternity leave and family issues can impact, for centrally impact in a woman uh, in the career to be developed by a, a, a woman. <coughs> so who want to start? Uh, let's maybe start with Sabrina. Can you, can you repeat that one more time? Sure, because I mix it too many things. Family, maternity leave, how these two uh, elements impact in the career of a woman who wants to continue on science and technology, because it's a coming to an age where you are starting to have a career and you have somehow to break, and if not break completely, to put more time on that. How is this uh, reality affecting uh, the progression of women in, in, in the fields and how to mitigate this negative impact in their careers? That is a really tough question. Yeah. And, um, you know, I have three small children. I had three under two years old at one point for, you know, what made it work for me was my um, commitment from my husband to give 100%. And without that partnership, I, I just don't, it, you know, it would have been very, very difficult for whatever reason, um, women are looked up in a lot of cases in society as the one responsible for raising children. And so I think to get beyond um, having to choose, you know, having a family or having a career, there has to be support. There has to be support from organizations and um, monetary support in certain cases, childcare, you know, the, the, the issues of being able to take time off and keeping your, your job while away, taking care of a young infant. But then for, you know, families to also feel comfortable going back to work, that they have good care to take care of their little one. And um, I think without that, it's going to be very hard to move beyond needing to make that decision, which is a very hard decision that you shouldn't necessarily have to make or that we would hope you wouldn't have to make. Thank you very much. And maybe Simona can uh, talk about that uh, she can project herself in that situation in the in the future. How do you feel about that? Uh, yes, I can agree with it. So it's a very difficult question for me now. I'm, I was say myself that family is after I hit my end my PhD. So yes, now I'm just delaying it and later on i don't know what i have what i will do it's, it's question which is in the future and i'm very scary to to reach it and at one time at, at my career i have to, i think i have to choose between work and and family uh, i think i i will work a little bit but in that time uh, but I think we need, as Sabrina said, understanding man besides that he can raise the children together, not the woman itself, herself. Uh, this so is, it's, it's, for me, it's just the scary question in the future. So now I don't have an answer. <laughs> No, you don't need to have an answer, and it's good that you mentioned that because this problem of uncertainty uh, and being scared is important and this is what discourages people to follow to pursue this kind of career so the idea will be to mitigate the, these uncertainties somehow as much as possible this is my personal view i don't know if someone of you want to complement on that maybe i would like to add one point i don't Please. have children so i am uh, <laughs> i didn't have to face personally some of the issues that uh, sabrina for instance had to uh, but I think that here we are also moving a bit outside the uh, issues that are specific to our field because this uh, issue of uh, uh, how to, compa to put together a career and a family life, etc., uh, is for every woman. 
in, uh, even if, uh, for every type of job, by the way. And uh, in Europe, we are lucky enough that once you have uh, reached a certain job security, our social protection networks are quite strong. So uh, I think that it, this helps a bit. In other places, it's not like that. What uh, could be done specifically in uh, fusion and nuclear industry is to recognize the huge investment that is put in a person to arrive to have, I don't know, a PhD in, uh, in uh, uh, material science or, or whatever, to arrive at, at this level where they can start really to be professionals very, very, very uh, useful, if you want, very, very productive. Uh, and this uh, is again something that, uh, that has to come from the top, a protection of investment. You have put so much as a society there. Don't waste it because uh, somebody needs uh, to take a maternity leave or something like that. Okay. I think this is a very good message. And as you say, uh, Gabriela, it's a transversal issue. It's not only fusion, but it's a general issue. So we move to a question which I like it because it's very challenging. So it says, we keep talking about this since uh, 2004, publicly at conference, but uh, which is okay. But in practice, what are we doing? So I think it's a very good question. What are we doing now? Or what, what should we do? Let's put it in that way. So maybe Gabriela, you can start and then we continue with the other okay. panelists. Isabel is a, is a personal friend of mine, so maybe... Okay. A... <laughs> Good coincidence. Good coincidence. Uh, yes, uh, I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer. I think uh, that uh, the fact that maybe certain things need to be discussed for a while before they really uh, take root uh, is, uh, is frustrating as is to be expected. And, uh, and I think that... Uh, Besides what uh, has been done or not been done in the past, I think that what we should be starting to in the future, or, I mean, from today, is uh, to to uh, to try to put in practice the things that we are saying. Here we are a group of women that, uh, one way or another, we have uh, uh, our uh, place in 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 the, in the fusion community, and uh, maybe this will be an occasion that is ends uh, now in ten minutes but uh, that we try to connect uh, personally through our organizations to, to push for the things that we all believe in. And uh, the networking, the mentoring, etc. And also to, to take a personal commitment to it. Because these kind of things take time and effort. Yeah. Ming, would you like to add something related to that? Because your previous statement were quite along that lines. <sighs> yes, I, I fully agree Gabriela's uh, appealings. I think for ITER, and some uh, ITER, so as a, a same function as IEA, as international organization, we could contribute to set up a more fellowship program through a partnership arrangement to, to attract more females to the international conference and to encourage them for publication. And uh, for ITER, I think is a good example. So every year we have this, uh, M, for example, for, uh, MT meetings on superconducting and uh, some of these uh, maglet uh, application meetings uh, encourage uh, people to share and to go for the meeting um, to show the achievement. So I, I, I think that uh, that is an international organization's function. <laughs> Uh, I would like to add something from the IEA side, and what, what you say, Ming, is completely true. International organizations should play a major role. It should be in their mandate to try to, 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 to help uh, women in enriching their objectives. So, and I'm proud to say that the agency is having a very active policy on that. One, uh, as our DDG explained in the introduction, we have launched this Marie Curie initiative, and we are, and I can feel it, okay? Uh, it's, it's not just a marketing thing, it's a reality that we, our management, is really pushing for that and trying to get new initiative to, towards to this uh, uh, goal. So, 
Um, I will encourage everyone to go to either website, to agency, uh, IEA website and check because there are a large number of new initiatives. And I also think we both uh, organizations should take sort of leadership, at least infusion on that area. We will discuss uh, later. So we are really running out of time. A uh, number of questions uh, still pending, but I will take one, the last one for closing the, this uh, Q&A session. And is uh, for all of us. The four of you have clearly uh, s some uh, successful career. So thank you very much. In the case of Sabrina, you have been had some first really breaking the glass ceiling, as we say. Could any of you, I would say all of you, describe with self-reflection the personal qualities that have helped you most uh, in the tough times? What was it drove you towards to overcome the challenge? So I would like to have two or three words from you uh, that define your personality or your approach to succeed in your career as a closing of this uh, Q&A session. So we can uh, start from the Gabriela, for example. <laughs> OK. For me, this is uh, the words would be passion for my work, would be resilience, and would be human uh, relations. Thank you very much. So we continue. Sabrina, please, two or three words. I think that. Um, so I was never the best of anything just from the get-go. It was always more about um, failing and then trying again and trying again. This goes to resilience that Gabriella just said. Um, hard work and determination and not giving up. And I think something that, that really underlies everything and sets the baseline is self-confidence. Believing in yourself. Good message. Uh... Ming, please. I think I would uh, take the opportunity to advocate uh, to build a team spirit, not uh, not only for personal personality. I think uh, I prefer to have a creative trust, individual and collective responsibility. Last but not least, we also advocate supporting women for family responsibilities. So that is more important for women career than men, <laughs> than to Europe contribute to whole society. It's, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Simona, please. So yes, about talking about being the, not, not the first, but all my life, then I started to learning physics. I was in, in a group where women is majority. For quite some time, I was the only woman in, in high school, in, in university, there was just two of us. <laughs> now, in, in my laboratory, they are just I in my work group, which working in fusion. But one thing for all my life was leading me. From around, uh, I don't know, 11 or 12, I was I said to myself, I will reach a bachelor, uh, a doctor degree. And every time that I wanted to quit it, I remember what I said, said for myself, I will reach it. And I fight it for it and I work hard for reach it. Reach it. So the one, one sentence that you have to reach doctor degree will help <laughs> me. Okay, thank you very much. And if I can add something from my side, I will say determination. You have to be determined to do it. And no matter what, you will reach your goal. So. Um, okay, with that, I would like to close the Q&A session, but not uh, not the event. We have uh, still uh, some uh, conclusions. I would like to uh, to thank to all people who put the question in the chat, and we couldn't answer because we have uh, so many. I think we have had a very good discussion, very dynamic, with all the panelists and all the questions coming. So. I, I have a really good impression. And I would like to mention a few key words that I have been noting during the, the, the discussion. So we, we were talking about mentoring. We were talking about training. We were work, talking about uh, networking. We were talking about coordination, community, and supporting environment. I think all these elements are really important. And I think it was very clear the need of having a forum where all these good ideas can be organized, 
we have enough data, we can try to establish a roadmap to have serious <laughs> action for that. And for that, we need serious commitment, if possible, coming from international organization, because it's where these kind of tools could be more available. Please, if you want to add something else about that, and I would like to announce that uh, from the agency, from the IEA and ITER, we are taking notes of all this, and we want to keep working on that. As I think uh, Gabriela said, we need commitment. Commitment is important and should come from us to pursue some more activities along these lines and to try to establish a frame where women can be helped and encouraged to progress. So if you want to add something else to that, happy to hear you. For me, count me in if you need me. <laughs> that is the best statement that I can have from, from you. So I, I, I will be waiting for some mentoring programs <laughs> in the future. Thank you very much. So if no more comments, I would like to thank all the panelists. It was really a great uh, discussion. All the audience who were attending, putting questions and uh, making this session really uh, interesting. And please keep enjoying the Fusion Energy Conference. We, we should be online again at 2 for the next session. Thank you very much to all of you. Bye. 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 Bye.